Hey Doombots, Tony Skinjili here with uh, part one of a four-part series discussing ISO 8s. Now, I understand there's a lot, right? Uh, ISO 8s are very simple to get, but really hard to master, which is one of the reasons why I really like this system in this game. Uh, and I'm going to make one very quick video just introducing you to the core of ISO 8s, the ISO 8s themselves, the classes of ISO 8s, and how you want to use them. We'll go into uh, more detail in each of those videos that are going to come out to kind of give you hopefully a full understanding of how they work and maybe a little bit of advice on how you want to apply them. I will say right now there are very few examples of one correct path to take with ISO 8s. Uh, a lot of times they are just slightly more detailed and we'll go into that as time comes on. I might start doing content on why certain characters want some of the ISO 8s or the classes on them, but we'll go into it. Starting right now, we're just going to talk about the ISO 8s themselves. ISO 8s are a static piece of gear, for lack of a better word. They give a bonus. That does not change at all. The number that's on the ISO 8 as of right now will always be equal to its dot. The dots being above top. Rank 1 is currently what you can buy in the store. Uh, rank 5 is something you can get lucky and pull out of an orb, or you can fuse copies of ISO 8s to uh, rank them up. The exact numbers of which we'll go into in detail later. But for now, just know that every ISO 8 always gives you the same bonus based on what its dot is. The only things that change is the role, uh, R-O-L-E, of the ISO-8 in that they are different based on blaster, controller, brawler, protector, or support, and the slot of the ISO-8. For example, if we look at my store right now, you will see uh, I, this is a blaster ISO-8, so it can only be placed on blaster type characters, uh, and it is a resist ISO-8, so it can only fill the resist slot of that. If you think of the slots in the same way you think about Stark Tech, if you're familiar with that. Stark Tech is the five basic important values of the game, health, focus, resist, armor, and damage. Uh, that's kind of where these are. This is uh, an extension of Stark Tech bonuses up to a maximum of 10% on each stat that can only be applied to specific characters. So for this example, if I were looking to work on a blaster, let's say Ultron. Um, seems like a reasonable blaster, right? This would be one of each ISO 8 of three of the five slots that he has. So I will go ahead and pick up all three of these. And then we're going to go check out Ultron and look about how I would apply them. So the new part of the screen just came up, ISO 8s. This is what they've been kind of making room for for the last couple of patches. Uh, this will be here on every single character, and it will kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what slots you have and what you're missing currently. Uh, the dots here will show just a quick snapshot of how strong the ISO 8 on the slot is, and the bottom dots will show how strong the class is. We'll get into that in just a moment. This is the ISO 8 screen gives you pretty much all the information you need to have regarding the character and how uh, their numbers work. And it's important to see this because as you move to the different slots, you will see that they give some percentage increase to these numbers. We'll start over here. This will be the armor slot. Uh, as of right now, I have enough to equip one Blaster Armor ISO 8 to Ultron. Uh, if I go ahead and equip it, which you've probably seen through the tutorial, it will just add a base 2% armor. Uh, same kind of goes across Blaster Resist, Blaster Health, Blaster Focus, and of course, Blaster Damage. If you notice you don't have one and want one, you can really quickly click Find, and it'll tell you obviously how to buy it or where you can go to farm it. Not particularly relevant. For each of these ISO 8s that you accomplish, uh, it will unlock the one star. The highest ISO 8 you have doesn't affect what rank your class is. So your ISO 8 class will always be whatever the lowest ISO 8 you currently have equipped. What does that mean? 
Well, if you get lucky or you spend a lot of money and get uh, a lot of ISO 8s and you rank up all four of these to five dot ISO 8s and your damage ISO 8 is just a lowly one dot, your class will only ever be one dot. And as it goes up, it will increase your class. So that's kind of the primer of ISO 8s. I don't want to go into too much more detail about that. Now I do want to talk about class. And for that, we're going to get off of Ultron and onto a character that maybe you may want to look at a little bit more. Because while Ultron's great, ISO 8s affect every character in the game, some a little bit better than others. So for here, we're going to take a look at my incredibly strong symbiote Spider-Man, whom I've already done quite a bit. So as you can see, I already have one of each ISO 8 on him, which I was able to target and farm as I progressed through the campaign, uh, which allows him to unlock his class. Class is what we're going to go into right now. All of these places are here. If you have the opportunity to upgrade, which you can see from right here, this is a Brawler Resist ISO 8. It takes a total of three ISO 8s to fuse and rank it up to a two dot. Uh, of which I can do, I don't intend on. It will increase his resist. I don't think he needs it right now, but it's an option. Um, I'm probably gonna put this on maybe another brawler. It's really important to kind of keep track of that. And especially because I don't quite have the pool of ISO 8s yet to bring everything up, I'll wait a little bit. But once you have all of the ISO 8 slots filled on any particular character, you now get to unlock the class of the character. There are five ISO 8 classes. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory, but I am going to go over them relatively quickly just to let you know without going uh, too deep in this part of the video. Uh, striker, Fortifier, Healer, Skirmisher, and Raider. Please do not necessarily look at the title and assume that every healer will always get healer. Every person using raids will always get Raider. That's not quite exactly how it works, but it's pretty close. Uh, when you look at each class... It gives you just a little bit of detail about what they do, enhance attacks and gain an extra attack on vulnerable targets. That's a new keyword for the future. Protect themselves, heal a low health ally each turn, create openings and critically hit more frequently. Let's take a quick look at each of these and kind of assess how that's gonna matter for the character after. So Striker, when you apply this class, it is immediately going to be a level one class because you can afford to apply a class. Uh, on primary hit, if the target is vulnerable, make ISO 8 bonus attack, which has its own color scheme to tell you it's something else, probably closer to an assist than an actual attack, at 50% damage, right? It tells you what it does. Uh, as you rank up, as the ISO 8s that you have on this character get higher dots, whether it be... Uh, 2 dot, 3 dot, and 4 dot, you can now apply a higher version, right here, of this ability. So for this case, uh, if I applied this and I had all 2 dots, I'd get more max health. If I did this, the ISO 8 bonus attack would do 75% of my damage instead of 50, all the way up to 100% uh, bonus attack damage, uh, a little bit extra health, 20% total extra health, and a flat 15% damage boost. This would make him a very, very big damage dealer. Now, the key thing to remember on this is just because he's applying vulnerable on the primary target attack uh, with whatever else he happens to be doing, doesn't mean that it wouldn't apply if someone else did something that applied vulnerable. So it's always kind of relevant to see which characters are vulnerable. For example, if every character on the opposing team was vulnerable, uh, whenever this character hits a target that has vulnerable, it would also bonus attack for 100% at the end of the tier. So that's quick on Striker, moving into Fortifier. Uh, Fortifier gives a little bit of a health boost at the beginning. It's a flat health boost, so in the early stages of the game, this is incredibly relevant. You're basically getting a free 10,000 health, more or less, uh, to start. Moving on, it gives you max health uh, on turn barrier self for a ton of money. This is a very survivable ISO 8 upgrade. So you would put this, obviously, your first thought is, well, I'm going to put this on a tanky character like uh, Strife or M'Baku or Luke Cage because they want to be tanky. And that's not inherently a wrong idea. That is a great idea, actually, because tanks want to be tanking. Uh, that said, um, you can also look at this from the other perspective. If you have a character that you notice is not surviving often, like, say, Domino on the X-Force or any Minerva raid, ever, 
This might be more relevant because not only does it give her a little bit extra health, but it gives her a co consistent ability to stay alive as well as increasing her overall max health by quite a bit. This is of course not including the actual bonuses you get from the isolates themselves, but we already talked about that so we don't have to worry about it. So, on Symbiote Spider-Man, if you notice that your Symbiote Spider-Man is getting killed too quickly, this would be a great upgrade to give him survivability for now while you look at building him out as a better damage dealer or whatever the rest of you are trying to use. So Fortifier is a defensive based trait, doesn't mean it's only useful for defensive characters, just means that it's useful for characters that need to be a little bit tougher in the fight. Healer, again, you would think they even show you, hey, why don't you apply the healer isolate to shield medic in the campaign, which is totally reasonable. Uh, active healing, for that people who are unfamiliar with that word means, it means whenever a heal occurs. Uh, so even if you don't have the ability to actually heal, you will eventually through this gain that. So basically just apply 5% to whatever the heal was going to be in the first place. That's what active healing means. And again, for record, minor regeneration is 5% instead of the standard 10% heal from normal regeneration. Uh, this is another great example, because you can look at Symbiote Spider-Man and say, well, I don't quite know if that's very re relevant on him. He's not really a healer, except that when he does heal not only himself, but the rest of his team, either through his passive, um, that extra 5% active healing, up to 15 when it's done, changes that 3% per negative debuff into maybe closer to a 6%. Uh, depending on how much the damage line comes up because it's applied after. So this is another ability that you would think, well, I'm going to put it on a healer, which you absolutely could and should, uh, might actually give you a little bit of value on stuff like Stimbiot Spider-Man or Ebony Maul or characters who heal as a result. Plus, this ability does have a built-in heal. On turn, heal lowest health ally for 5% of this character's max health. Uh, and it gives you... 20% health through the investment. So really good setup and really good on characters. Again, kind of if they're having a hard time staying alive in a raid, this might be the difference maker, especially on like war defense and stuff. Uh, next, we'll finish up with Skirmisher on primary hit, which is whenever the target, single target of your attack goes through, apply vulnerable, gain some extra health. If the target has vulnerable, he clears a positive effect as long as it's single target, so you can't just AoE everybody and remove all the buffs. On primary hit, if target is vulnerable, clear two. This is a very utility ability. You know, uh, on Symbiote Spider-Man, it sounds great. You're applying vulnerable on the uh, attack to the main target. You're gaining a little bit extra survivability, which is obviously, as we talked about, really good. And the ability to casually clear positive effects through attacks, especially on single target attacks or AoE attacks where you can select the correct target, maybe. Huge. This is also really big for characters that are trying to get rid of taunts in raids. Uh, it helps the, if the character uh, has vulnerable applied to them. Now you've turned an attack that wouldn't get rid of the taunt into attack that would, or something like death proof. Kind of a big deal. So this is a great ability to put on a character like Symbiote Spider-Man, or basically any damage dealer, because it's just a little bit of survivability and a little bit of utility as you go on. Finally, we can end with Raider. On crit, apply plus one vulnerable up to a maximum of three. And then it, again, increases health, increases crit chance, increases crit damage. Uh, this is one that's a little bit more unique. Now, depending on the base crit of your character, most base crits are like 10%. So at rank five, this is a uh, pretty decent 35% crit chance. At base right now, level one, it gives your character who has 10% crit 25% crit, that's one out of every four attacks. If the character has some kind of guaranteed crit mechanism, like maybe a Killmonger or um, Hawkeye or, or somebody who has a boosted crit, these get significantly better. But the biggest thing about all this is the purpose of this is the damage dealer who applies vulnerable. So look at characters that AoE um, with a high crit chance. Killmonger is a perfect example of one of them, but there's plenty of others. If the character AoEs and crits, that applies vulnerable to everyone who is hit by the crit. That's a big deal. So if this is the big damage dealing AoE build on Raider, and that's pretty much the core of 
the the classes again there's no one correct path but there are correct paths to accomplish task a or task b and that's going to bring us to our last part of this video just to keep it quick and short for everybody uses of iso weights how you are going to apply them and to do that we're going to look at a full team that probably a lot of people have some experience with we're going to look at aim so let's take the aim team as an example of a team iso eights in general like i said have multiple different uses but it's going to come down to what i call easy medium and hard skill levels the easy skill level is to look at what the character does and to improve the quality of what that character does. So Scientist Supreme, is, she's kind of the aim team's healer, and outside of that, she really doesn't do much. She can, you know, help your generic team in a raid. Uh, so for her specifically, when you look at the kind of classes you would put on her, you probably are going to avoid using Striker, uh, raider or skirmisher she doesn't really attack that often which kind of leaves you between fortifier and healer now since she does have a heal for her team healer is a huge boost to her but at the same time you also want her to be a little bit tanky so fortifier would be a huge uh, buff for her and that's anywhere you use her right anytime you want to make sure that she's either healing more whether it be on her team or a specific team you put together to use her like tech wing and u7 or fortifier to make sure she stays live long enough to be able to maybe res a character that went down or throw out a heal or something like that. So when you look at a character like that, you say like, obviously fortifier and healer, super huge uh, bonuses to her as a character. And you can do this for every character and aim, kind of figure out what they do on their own. The second, the medium level of skill for this is to look at what they do for their team. So if we take Scientist Supreme on a standard aim team, which, you know, Scientist Supreme, Aim Researcher, Graviton, Security, uh, Assaulter, maybe you're using Monstrosity or Infector. Either case, totally reasonable. What does Scientist Supreme do on that team? Well, nothing really changed from the previous assessment. She's not really a big damage dealer. She doesn't do it too often. But she's a significantly better healer on that team because they don't get the downside buff. So... For her, even though you may have wanted her to be a little bit more survivable uh, when using her on a mishmash team or just independently of what she's supposed to do, on her team, healer goes up a huge margin because she is constantly healing. She's constantly throwing out regen stacks and flipping debuffs. And the extra benefit you get from increasing her health pool makes her heals better. Increasing the amount of healing makes her heals better. On turn, heal the lowest health ally. That works really well with the rest of her kit. So on the aim team, she becomes clearly a better healer uh, than she would be on some mishmash team because there's less of the downside from her abilities. Uh, and now we get into the, the high, high skill cap line. And this is more... Okay, let's not talk about how she works like we know what she does we've read her kit but let's not talk about what she does on her team because we know what she does on her team so it's pretty easy to kind of combine one and two and get three now let's talk about the the variables and really quickly don't just think about it from the perspective of well scientist supreme on her team gets this and the team is better that's true but what if you're trying to be a specific team uh for example if you are using the aim team in arena to beat up on, we'll say like the guardians or the defenders, like some team that generally has a higher power uh, level than them, but they don't have the sustain or maybe the control. Well, that's when you start looking at what ISO 8s do on characters for specific purposes. And that's what the game is gonna become as we get more and more into it. It's gonna be less about this character does this so strengthen the thing they do and more about i need this character to do this so how do i help beat this team so if you're using aim and war to beat up uh, a you know a supernatural team or an asgardian teams with ultron or, or something like that 
you don't necessarily care about making AIM be the best version of AIM it can be. You care more about how you can make the AIM team beat the Asgardian. So for that example, well, if you're still using the full AIM team, as we've already kind of talked about, you know that Fortifier and Healer are pretty good options, and you really don't run into too many issues with that. But what about those other abilities we ignored earlier? Let's use Striker for example. She's already putting a ton of debuffs on through her normal kit. So if you put this ability on her, then that turn one ability to uh, not only hit someone and put debuffs on them, but also proc a vulnerable target might work very well with, say, a Graviton who's about to AoE characters and hopefully has the uh, Raider buff to remove some some stats or crit chance you know you want to look at every single character as to how they're going to work and that's where you can start seeing a little bit of extra value maybe you don't need your scientist supreme to be the best healer on your team because you're using a researcher and she's just healing for the aoe uh debuff she throws out on the other team maybe she's survivable enough because it's the fights you're going up against they either don't target her or they she's you know got high red stars or something like that that's when you can start looking at the other abilities and more importantly, how you're using them, how you're using her entire team, how you're using uh, her as a character with whatever team she put together and what they're trying to do. You're gonna see a lot of, of information about ISO 8s. You're gonna see a lot of content come out telling you that like Symbiote Spider-Man gets the Skirmisher ISO 8 and that's period, the end. And that isn't inherently wrong. But there is a, a third level to deciding how to apply ISO 8s well beyond what immediately impacts character A and what immediately impacts character A on team X. You do need to see what are you doing. For players who are in U7 right now, you will probably agree that you're using mishmash teams of characters that happen to work well, but more specifically to beat the node. You're, you know, there's some nodes in, in U7 where there's a lot of characters that uh, Loki and Mystique that make your characters kill your own team. So you might not want to bring in the strongest possible characters you have. You might bring in a little bit of weaker characters that have more sustain than you would uh, just try to one shot everything. That depends on you. And that's when you're going to start looking at ISO 8s for what they really are, which is a great system to help you tweak your team to be able to accomplish different types of tasks. And as we go into uh, future videos and we talk about specific ISO 8s and why they're important, how to get them, how to use them, we'll go into a handful of team comps and, and ideas and applications of how you would apply uh, ISO 8 classes to five members of a mishmash team for U7 or a war defense team to really improve what you expect to get out. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I tried to make this video as quick as possible because I have a lot of details going in the future, but hopefully this was enough. If you have any questions, you can stop by my stream, twitch.tv slash Tony Skinjali, or you can comment below. I can't guarantee I can answer every one, but you might give me a reason to add specific things to future videos I make. Peace, guys.